like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Thanks for joining us at the Yong National University of Singapore, Yong Lubin School of Medicine's Healthy Longevity Webinar. I'm happy to be here. To, it's actually four in the morning for me, but I'm happy to be here tonight, your time, for uh, to hear Professor Zong Chui Lin, who is one of our very own here at NUS, and she'll be telling us about uh, longevity. But before we start that, I want to remind you to use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions, and we have Shara here, which will handle the questions tonight. And I want to start off tonight with a video uh, from Jacinda Lee, a senior research fellow at the Center for Healthy Longevity, and she'll be presenting uh, about her own research, Measuring Frailty in Mice. Thank you for the kind introduction. As mentioned, my name is Jacinda, and I'm a senior research fellow working on the Mouse Interventional Program in CHL. Today, I'll be sharing about one of the tests that we do in CHL, which is the frailty index scoring in mice. Firstly, frailty is defined as an increased risk to stresses that can cause one to become weaker or sick. Examples of frailty is feeling weak or losing weight unintentionally, and all this could actually lead to poor health or being unable to recover as quickly as back when you were healthy. As more people age, there will be an increasing proportion of people becoming frail. So this study actually shows that in a group of people aged 65 years and older, approximately 5.2% of the men become frail, while this number actually doubles for females. And consequently, as one becomes more frail, there will be more health issues, and then this could increase the financial burden. So the overall aim of our mouse interventional program is actually to identify potential compounds that can help reduce frailty and improve health span. And hopefully, these studies can be, then be translated to humans in the future. So to assess frailty in mice, we actually adopt a frailty index scoring that shows translatable correlation to human frailty. This scoring is based on the frailty index scoring published by Whitehead et al. And the pros of this test is that it's actually non-invasive. So we can just observe and score the mice. Briefly, it's a 31-point tool assessing all these features that you see on the screen. If the mice are unaffected, unaffected for each point, we give a zero score. However, if they are badly affected, we actually give them a score of one. So overall, the higher the score, the worse the frailty, meaning poorer health span. Here are some of the examples of young versus old mice from pictures sourced online for better visualization and to show everybody what we are looking at. So mice do get old and they do get frail with age. So we can see on the bottom right that as the mouse ages, they do lose fur compared to a younger mice. They also do get white hairs and the furs are not as shiny as before. They also develop kyphosis, which is the arching of the spine, as you can see on the top right corner. One of the tests that we also do is actually to check on their muscle function. So if they have the strength to grip. So in the first video, you can see here in the healthy young mouse, it actually has a very good grip. It has the strength to lift the small metal rack. And for that, we give them a score zero. So in the second video on the right, is that of an older mouse, where it's unable to have a good grip, nor have the strength to lift the rack. So for this mouse, we actually give them a score of 0 0.5. For a mouse that would have a score of one, it would essentially not be able to lift the rack at all. So in our program, 
we actually feed aged mice with different compounds of interest to investigate whether they can actually reduce frailty. And this study can last six months or more. So during this period, we will perform the frailty test, score all the parameters, average them out and compare to when they were first starting and to see how the males, how the mice actually became frail over time. And here's examples of some of the results that we have. So we have the control mice given the control feed. So that's indicated by the line in black. So these mice were not given any compounds of interest. Next, we have all the different colors indicating the four different compounds that we are currently looking at. And we can see how they fare compared to the black line. So in conclusion, performing this frailty index scoring on our mice actually allows us to determine how the compounds affect frailty. So do they get better? Do they get worse? What is the effectiveness of the compound, such as looking at the green line versus the red line, how good they are in reducing frailty, and how these compounds can actually affect the males versus the females. So once again, on the screen, you can see that these compounds actually do seem to benefit the male more than the females. So ultimately, all this data will help in our research as we determine how, what, which is the best compound to move forward for further studies. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jacinda. Um, so tonight we have Professor Zong uh, Chui Lin. She's a chair professor on women's health at the in Young Lilian School of Medicine here in the US uh, and the director of the Global Center for Asian Women's Health, GLOW. Uh, she's also lead of the Population Health Study Program here at our very own Asian Center for Reproductive Longevity and Equality. Uh, and before joining in, in US, she was a senior investigator with tenure and interim chief of the epidemiology branch, of the division of population health at the National Institute of Health in the United States. So uh, we stole her from the US and we're happy to have her. And she's gonna tell us tonight about promoting healthy longevity as a life course journey from the young. Thanks for joining us, Traylon. Thank you so much, Brian, um, for the kind introduction and for having me. Um, it is a great pleasure uh, of speaking as a part of this brilliant health longevity webinar series. So let me share my screen next. I'd like to um, open my, uh, my lecture by sharing this slide describing health aging um, over life course and particularly highlight uh, the point that Achieving healthy longevity is a lifelong journey and should start young, not to wait until late in life. And in this regard, women's health at reproductive age, including both early middle age and future old, is particularly relevant as it is not just concerns women's own health, but also um, for the uh, goodness of the next generations. So a couple of unique women's health characteristics have been related to increased risk of disease morbidities and the premature mortality. So for instance, this include early age of minor key, irregular menstrual cycle, prolonged time to pregnancy, history of infertility, major pregnancy complications such as gestational diabetes, gestational hypertensive disorders, and preterm delivery. And after pregnancy, some of you may know that lactation practice and shorter breastfeeding duration has been related to increased risk for type 2 diabetes and the cardiovascular disease as well. So next, as examples, I will show some data supporting these associations based on large human epidemiological studies. The data I'm going to present today all from human population health research, and none of them are animal models, just for your information. Uh, so first, uh, menstrual health. So menstrual cycle status has been regarded as an indicator for overall health status of women at reproductive age. And data from large epidemiological studies show that both irregular and long menstrual cycles were associated with increased risk of chronic diseases, such as type 2 diabetes and the cardiovascular disease and the premature mortality. So here's the data based on uh, more than 100,000 female nurses in the US. And these women have been following up since the late 80s for more than 30 years. And this is a part of the, uh, the US nurses health study. 
I'm sure some of them, um, some of you are aware of this. So as you can see from um, this figure um, on the left, so women who had always a regular cycle, the right line, was related to greater incidence for uh, cardiovascular disease starting from 45 years old as compared with women with very regular menstrual cycle. And then the y-axis, it represents um, the cumulative incidence of cardiovascular disease. X-axis is for women's age. And menstrual cycle status uh, across women's reproductive lifespan was also examined in this study. So as you can see from uh, the figure on the right, um, so consistently at a different age group, those who had a regular um, cycle experience the greatest risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. And similarly, women who always had a regular, a regular cycle, so this, uh, black, I think this black line in my, on my screen. Uh, so on the top, this, this line um, was related to greater incidence for type two diabetes as compared with women with very regular menstrual cycle. Uh, the y-axis represents um, the cumulative incidence of type 2 diabetes. X-axis uh, represents women's age. So given this data, not surprisingly, a regular menstrual cycle was related to higher risk for premature mortality. So as you can see from this figure, um, usually a regular or always a regular so this is green and the purple lines on my screen uh, were related to a greater risk of premature mortality starting from age 50. And again, the y-axis uh, represents the cumulative incidence of deaths and x-axis represents women's age. And of particular note, so the higher risk of premature mortality associated with a regular menstrual cycle was independent of overall body adiposity status um, as uh, characterized by body mass index. And the association uh, was present even among women without other signs of PCOS. As some of you may know that a regular menstrual cycle is a major character of PCOS. So all these suggested that the menstrual cycle characteristics might serve as an independent proxy for overall health status of women, for women of reproductive age. Uh, move on to another critical event in Paris women's life, which is pregnancy. So women's health status during pregnancy can have substantial lifelong health implications as well. As some of you may know that during pregnancy, women's uh, body experience tremendous cardiometabolic hormone changes. And these changes may serve as stress tests or challenges to unveil women who are at greater susceptibility for cardiometabolic diseases later in their lives. So in this way, pregnancy complications may help identify those women at high risk for chronic diseases later in their lives. So for instance, I always use um, uh, diabetes, gestational diabetes as an example. So for instance, for women who first develop diabetes in pregnancy, that is gestational diabetes, even though for majority of them, their blood glucose levels often return to normal after delivery, these women on average have more than seven-fold increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in their lives. And not just for type 2 diabetes, they also add high risk for cardiovascular disease, renal dysfunction, and liver dysfunction. Um, so as an example, the figure on the right corner uh, represents our data on cardiovascular disease by following Paris women for more than 30 years. So as you can see, starting from uh, around 10 years um, after the index pregnancy, so women who develop diabetes in pregnancy had greater risk for developing cardiovascular disease than those who didn't develop gestational diabetes. And this excess risk continues to increase even after 30 years of the index pregnancy. And similarly, um, we also found that women who experience other common pregnancy complications, such as preterm delivery, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease as well. 
And most recently, based on another large pregnancy cohort in the U.S. of more than 45,000 pregnant women with more than 50 years of follow-up of women who had a pregnancy between the 50s to 60s, from 1950s to 1960s. So we found that women who experienced any of any of these common pregnancy complications, um, including hypertensive disorder in pregnancy, preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, preterm delivery, had increased risk of premature mortality in the next 50 years after the index pregnancy. So here are the data. Um, and then the uh, hazard ratio and the risk difference were adjusted for other major confounders, including preference body mass index and risk ethnicity. So as a brief summary, so accumulated data support significant associations of major women's reproductive events with later disease risk and premature mortality. And the data I presented is just a tip of iceberg on existing evidence, and I mainly picked uh, mental cycle status and pregnancy complications as examples. Um, other reproductive um, health factors, um, such as age of many key, time to pregnancy, infertility history, and lactation were all relevant. And certainly, so I have to confront that. So certainly, uh, different from animal studies and randomized clinical trials, so this data from large human population studies cannot prove causality. Say we cannot prove whether these reproductive events caused these diseases. So even though the observed association were um, biological plausible, but as you see, it is really unlikely possible, or I would say impossible to conduct randomized controlled trial in human population to examine the association. So I would say, um, I would think it's fair to say, so this evidence from high quality, large population data, at least highlight the significance of early or middle age reproductive health events in women's life over their lifespan. So which can inform the identification of women at high risk for later chronic diseases and for premature mortality. So that health promotion and prevention may target at these women. And as I mentioned earlier, women's health is not only important for women themselves, but also for the next generations. And tons of data um, support the developmental origin um, of chronic diseases hypothesis, the Doha hypothesis. And the uterine environment with mom and the first nine months is critical for offspring's health over their lifespan. So for instance, uh, the diabetes begetting diabetes vicious circle, as some of you are familiar with uh, with uh, examples, so offspring born from pregnancies complicated by gestational diabetes are at high risk for obesity and impaired glucose metabolism and type 2 diabetes as well. And when these um, children grow up and for uh, for female, they are more likely to develop diabetes in, in pregnancy as well. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to get to the detail, but just um, just show some recent data from three large cohort studies um, of approximately uh, 300,000 uh, women uh, demonstrating that low birth weight was related to a significantly increased risk for premature mortality, in particular for uh, CVD and uh, respiratory diseases mortality. So birth weight, although not ideal, but often uh, used as a proxy in, for, for in utero growth. So after seeing all these data supported of the significant link between women's reproductive and the pregnancy um, events with later mobility and the mortality, so one may be wondering, so what? So what's next? <laughs> what can be done to improve women's health and longevity among women at high risk? Are there factors that may help lower morbidities and the premature mortality? If nothing can be done to follow up, it won't be helpful. But yes, indeed, accumulating data, including those from ours, have shown that health for diet and lifestyle can lower the risk of adverse reproductive and pregnancy complications. 
And the risk, and also low the risk for chronic diseases among women at high risk. And as a consequence to increase life expectancy. So here are some data show from, from our own study show that three commonly recommended healthy diet patterns, namely Mediterranean diet, a healthy eating index based on the current US diet guidance, and the diet diet in early and mid pregnancies was really were related to reduce the risk of major pregnancy complications, including gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and preterm delivery. And we also show that by looking at the joint effect of major potentially modifiable factors, so we found that more than 40% of GDM event cases may be prevented by adapting healthy diet, regular exercise, and weight control and quit smoking. And postpartumly, so by following up more than uh, 4,000 GDM women for more than 30 years, we observed that adapting healthy diet and lifestyle are related to more than 90% uh, lower risk of type 2 diabetes among women with a history of gestational diabetes. And as just as I just discussed, so these women are at exceptional high risk for type 2 diabetes and comorbidities. So these are indeed encouraging and hopeful messages for these women at high risk. So even though they are at high risk, there is a hope their risk may be lowered. So of note, we also observe that healthful diet and lifestyle can even mitigate greater genetic susceptibility of type 2 diabetes as characterized by higher genetic risk score or family history of diabetes. So I also would like to share an interesting meta-analysis published last year by a Norwegian researcher, which demonstrates that a sustained change from a typical Western diet to a healthy, relatively healthy diet since age 20 years would increase life expectancy by more than a decade um, for women, uh, for example, from the United States. Um, and this, the largest gains would be made by eating more legumes, whole grains, and nuts, and less red meat. And the earlier, we found that the earlier the dietary changes are initiated in life, and the larger gain in life uh, expectancy. So taking all this together, I would say there is compelling evidence supporting the notion that promoting healthy longevity should start young with keen attention to women's reproductive health and gynecology conditions. So then what's next? What should be done in practice? So first I would say we should early try to early identify women at high risk. So this may be through risk factors and a biomarker discovery. And then we need to follow up women at high risk and to intervene and to prevent. And diet and lifestyle changes have been so effective in research studies. I like to say highlight here in research studies, but behavior changes are difficult. So how to make changes sustainable and applicable to general population? I think it's remain a big challenge. And this requires multiple disciplinary joint efforts involving uh, policy makers. And I would also like to call more work in Asian population, particular for while conducting study on, the, on women's health in Asian population. So I'm emerging, but remain limited. So in general, as some of you may know that, despite the fact that Asians make up 60% of the world's population, but only 10% of clinical trials and genetic databases have Asian representation. So partly motivated by this, I moved from US to Singapore last year to set up a global center for Asian women's health at the NUS Yang Longlin School of Medicine with the support from the senior leadership. So with the major goal of improving women's health and longevity over their lifespan and across generations, where are huge knowledge gaps and in, in enormous demands for health promotions exist. So Brown, if you don't mind, next I'm going to take the opportunity to briefly introduce our Women's Health Center uh, briefly which I think also relevant to, to the lecture theme. Um, 
So this is just a brief introduction. So uh, the center was, as I mentioned, was established last year around this time. It aims to build a population health program to address major women's health concerns over the lifespan and across generations. And it was set up to build and nurture an international a multidisciplinary platform to chart a path to a healthy and happy future for Asian women in Singapore and also worldwide by working with local and global partners and stakeholders. So I'm sure many of you would agree with our vision that women's health is key to families, communities, and societies. And healthy and happy women are foundations for a healthy and happy society. And from population health and clinical uh, perspectives, so we will promote Asian women's health and well-being over their lifespan. So our missions include research, training, and practice. I'm not going to read this all. So as our center is a population health program, we are particularly uh, interested in um, identifying potentially modifiable risk factors at both behavior uh, lifestyle level and at molecular levels related to women's health and to examine the interplay of diet, lifestyle, and environmental factors with genetic, epigenetic factors for the prevention of common disease uh, disorders um, among women. And some of the data I just presented uh, reflected some of our efforts along this line. And this is a snapshot um, of people affiliated to uh, our center so far. So we have been benefiting from the advice and support uh, from the Dean of NUS Young Learning School of Medicine, Professor Yap Sun Chung, and the Dean of Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Professor Michelle Williams, since uh, the strategic planning stage of the center establishment. And then um, a couple of other colleagues that I'd like to highlight so Dr. Kun Lee, uh, the um, assistant professor and also the program head um, of our center has played a pivotal role in the center since the very first beginning. And Dr. Jia Xi Yang um, is leading the nutrition and lifestyle working group. And Dr. Guo Qi Yu um, is leading the omics group. And uh, Dr. Wei Wei Pang is leading the lactation group. And I also like to mention Professor Johan Erikson, so also the executive director of SS of ISTA and the current leader for Gusto and Espresso study, has been a key supporter and advocate of our center. Um, and we have position opening, and we are in the process of recruiting more faculties and staffs and fellows. So we have um, we have been. Uh, actively working with a number of local and international partners, including long-term collaborators such as Harvard Medical School, from Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health, Hopkins in the US, and locally, we closely um, uh, um, partnering with Acre, led by Brian and also Zhongwei. Uh, we are uh, leading the population health program within the Acre Center as well. So in terms of major research efforts in our center, so so far we have five um, main research themes. So namely cardiometabolic health, uh, reproductive health, cancer prevention and screening, aging and longevity, and mental health and wellness. And four uh, domain, um, four main cross-cutting research areas. Um, so namely nutrition and uh, lifestyle, omics work, lactation, and digital health. We have a bit ongoing research program across the four themes. I'm not going to get to the details. So to wrap up, so with the belief that the healthy and happy women are the cornerstone for healthy and happy families and a healthy, ha happy society. So at the center, we strive to build and develop an international multidisciplinary platform with local and global partners to address women's major health concerns over lifespan and across generation. And given the huge knowledge gaps, we have a lot to do along the way. And we believe that investing in women's health, and I hope you all 
I can convince you all <laughs> that investing in women's health will ultimately con contribute to economic and social development, not only for individual women, but also for their families, communities, um, and societies. And I think this is my last slide. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Cherry Lynn. That was great. And I, it brings a lot of questions to mind. Um, and I think that maybe a good place to start is there were a couple of terms you used that I'm not sure everybody knows. And so I thought I would just ask you directly so you can give maybe a sentence on what they are. So you mentioned PCOS. Uh, I'm not sure what everybody in the audience knows what that is. So can you tell us what that is? It's poly over syndrome. Uh, so that is a common um, uh, that is a common um, syndrome <laughs> uh, that is a major cause uh, for infertility. And uh, one of the major characteristics of this syndrome is uh, irregular menstrual cycle. And also um, women with PCOS always like have obese, more often to be like obese, overweight. And just one more preeclampsia. Oh, preeclampsia. <laughs> Preeclampsia is a is one of the hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. It's a common pregnancy complication. But actually, this is a very interesting. So the the disease etiology for preeclampsia is still a, a mystery. Um, but a major syndrome for preeclampsia it is a combined of hypertension and uh, protein urea. So usually those we really often use uh, part of the diagnosis criteria. But uh, the Pathogenesis etiology are still unclear. So it's a disease of well, different series, the preeclampsia. I did my, my PhD thesis on this uh, genetics for preeclampsia, but then I feel it's so difficult to study. So I thought I'll move toward diabetes later. <laughs> <laughs> well, that leads me to the question with just is gestational diabetes going up, just like uh, type 2 diabetes and in the population and I, in general, yeah, one of the major risk factors for uh, gestational diabetes in general is obesity. So with the obesity going up and also the adapting of Western lifestyle and uh, in general, gestational diabetes rate is going up. Um, but also it depends on the different di diagnosis criteria, but now the diagnosis criteria used worldwide is with a relatively like loose criteria. So the, which identify the more gestational diabetes cases, they find more gestational diabetes cases. Um, so the, for example, like using the new diagnosis criteria, so in Asian population in general, it can complicate it uh, uh, around 18 to 20% of, pre of pregnancies, gestational diabetes. It's really common, uh, a common pregnancy complication. When is it, no, when is it diagnosed during pregnancy? So, so different countries have different criteria. So the, for the research I presented, which, which major um, from the US, US population, so we use the Carpenter criteria. This is like two steps, diagnosis um, uh, procedures. Um, so usually like uh, around 24 to 28 weeks gestation, we'll screen with a screening test. And then we use glucose, oral glucose tolerance test to diagnose it. Sorry, my phone is acting up. <laughs> <laughs> it is okay. Who's calling me at four thirty in the morning? But let me turn it off. You're amazing. So early. <laughs> um, one of the things that crossed my mind as you were talking, uh, and this comes, this is relevant to both the uh, the the long term risk of women that have irregular menstrual cycles and other other issues during pregnancy. Um, gestational diabetes, for instance, is, you know, is there a causality? You mentioned that you can't determine this, but you can speculate. Uh, is there a causality uh, with these problems during pregnancy and later complications, or is it just the same risk factors that are driving both of them? So it's really hard. It's, uh, so I would think they're like, um, I would say both ways. So it's possible like this, um, early reproductive uh, factors like uh, mental cycle, irregular mental cycle. So share common pathway with later disease. For example, the HPO axis is really important for 
later metabolic disease, type 2 diabetes as well, and also insulin resistance, like glucose metabolism. So they share a common pathway. And then the other series might be something like uh, after the development of um, certain early um, early um, complication like gestational diabetes, there might be some changes in the body glucose, like in the um, glucose metabolism system, damage that it may lead to additional risk for type two diabetes or CVD later in their lives. But um, what, which one is 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 true? I don't think it's really that important <laughs> because I feel this can help us to characterize this association. It can help us identify the high risk population so that we can do something early in in life. Um, before it is too late, before the com the comorbidity is developed. Yeah, and so in, in, you mentioned it also establishes uh, it's a higher risk for the the babies as well as they grow up. And so, why is that? Is it just that the you know that's an important time during development and establishing a poor metabolic health then is a uh, how, that must affect the behavior. Yeah, I think. Yes. Up, I guess the parents can still affect it at that point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. I think there are, there, you, you may know the data better that there are quite a lot of animal data, actual initial data from animal studies regarding development origin hypothesis. But then later in the human, we show the, the association. Again, it's association. But there are also recently some data show that, for example, for hyperglycemia in pregnancy, it can affect the epigenetic changes. For some genes, like in in the placenta and also in core blood, so that may have a prolonged impact for the children, for the offspring as well. But more data, I would feel like um, mechanistic data from animal data, from animal studies. I wonder, you know, how much does the management of health during pregnancy affect long term uh, outcomes? So, if if gestational diabetes is managed with lifestyle. Um, does that lead to healthier lifestyle after pregnancy and reduced uh, risk of various uh, age-related <laughs> That's a that's a good question. Um, behavior change is really is really difficult, but sometimes the pregnancy is special in women's life. So usually during pregnancy, like women are more motivated. Uh, to change their behavior. For example, if they know, if they have a previous pregnancy complicated by gestational diabetes, in this pregnancy, they are more like um, likely to change their behavior. And this may have a, maybe you have a lifelong impact um, on their uh, behavior as well. So we feel like pregnancy is really a unique time window. Maybe you can um, intervene like to help women also, women can affect the family and the next generation. Like it's a unique time window. Maybe can um, can do more about behavior intervention or changes. Maybe more successful. There's such a special time window um, in in women's life, and also for the family. I wonder um, with the uh, regular menstrual cycles, and uh, I guess this was from the nursing study looking at long term cardiovascular risk. Um, can you detect any uh, cardiovascular differences uh, in women at the time they're having the regular menstrual cycles, or, or is there anything that can be measured at that time point? Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a this is a great question. If I if I'm going to design a study, I would like to have like, the baseline measurement, like um, um, starting from early life about the measurement of cardiometabolic. Um, phenotypes, but most of the studies I, I presented, they don't have those uh, phenotype data, um, mask phenotype data in early life, and only later. So this also is quite common, only later, like among, from middle age and later age, like studies started oh. collecting this data. Uh, but it would be ideal if we can have, but maybe some of the studies here, like um, in Singapore, for example, the gastro study, espresso study, they are collecting data from, from children, very detailed phenotype data about the cardiometabolic factors. If we follow up these children or follow up these women, yeah, maybe we can answer that question, Brian. So we need to look earlier, basically. Yes, have to start early. Yeah, and I guess that uh, brings me to uh, 
Well, let me let me ask a couple of uh, more background questions because I think the audience might be interested in this. Here's a question that I get all the time okay, <laughs> on aging. Um, does pregnancy or number of pregnancies affect healthy lifespan in women? I'll let you answer it. I'm tired of answering. <laughs> this is a... Um... This is a, is a, is a, I don't think there is a perfect answer for this. <laughs> um, so I would think like um, there are two parts of this question. First is whether you like not a Paris, compare with Paris women, like have any pregnancy or not, right? Whether these, they have different risk for cardiovascular disease. And the other question is the number for Paris, for Paris women, or why did the number make a difference? Like a high number of parity will be related to um, chronic disease. So for the second part, there are some data show because the solution can be fraught by, by diseases. So for example, for type two diabetes and the CVD based on my knowledge is like increased the parity is related to greater risk. Um, and, um, and for, um, so for the first part, Paris, not a Paris, and for cancer, this might, can make different. For example, for breast cancer, like uh, for women who never had a pregnancy or live birth, maybe at high risk. So there is not a general answer to this question. It really depends on the disease outcomes. <laughs> it's okay to have babies. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Let me ask another general question. Um, and this is one that I talk about a lot or get asked questions about as well is, you know, what are the complications related to menopause in women for long-term risk? And, and are, are there specific factors of aging that are accelerated in women because of menopause uh, or, and, and ovarian aging, uh, early ovarian aging, or is it just every general everything in aging is accelerating. So this, I, I don't feel, I think this is a good question, but I don't feel I have a good answer because I personally, I don't have enough knowledge on this like regarding overall aging. Um, so maybe, I don't know, Brian, based on animal, I know you're doing work uh, regarding on animals, but there some data can help to answer this question. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's there's some specific things that we see, like uh, both in women and and animals. Bone bone density is one that it seems to be relevant, uh, and a few others. So to me, it seems like you know many things are accelerated, some slightly more than others, but um, it's definitely you know an increased risk after menopause. It's a bit of a challenge to study this in animal models because. Uh, mice don't go through a formal menopause, so they do have a decline in estrogen with age, but it's more of a gradual decline. It's not an abrupt decline. And so I think that probably dampens the effect of ovarian aging in mice relative to humans, which are one of the few species that have menopause, So, which is another mm -hmm. question we can talk about some other time. Um, but uh, I think that... Uh, so it, it adds a little bit of a challenge to answering that question using animal models. Um, maybe I could just close by addressing the topic of Asian women versus Western women. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, a paucity of studies of Asian women. Um, and uh, so what are the, you know, and, and the need to address that issue. So what are what are the some of the differences that may exist between uh, reproductive health and aging in the Asian women versus Western women. Yeah, there are so um, yes, there there. If you for you know, we passed, so we we have been because before even before I moved to Singapore, I want to know more about research on uh, women Asian women's health better. So we our team uh, conducted uh, several systematic review or uh, meta analysis trying to look at the data. But give you an example, because when we look at diabetes research, um, gestational diabetes, like and the progression to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, there are not much really good data available, which long-term follow-up, um, and especially those two try to answer the question, what factors can predict 
the adverse progression later uh, after the in-depth pregnancy. So that is only one example. And um, but Asian, can we apply like what have been found in the U.S. population in Western population to Asian? Yes, some can be. I think can in theory it can be, but also Asian they have their unique phenotype. So back to back to diabetes again or gestational diabetes. Actually, it is very um, the incidence is very high in Asian. Asian population is is the high of the highest risk for gestational diabetes compared with that's a, that's a little bit surprising because obesity it is <laughs> it is so that also shows the difference like Asian usually they are lean in general so why Asian has their own unique phenotype so in our center I think led by uh, by Queenie uh, Dr Queenie Lee she's trying to look into some unique phenotype of gestational diabetes Asian unique phenotype of gestational diabetes as an example. So to answer your question, I think it is Asian have their own unique uh, phenotypes, but definitely need more research. Cannot simply generalize those from the investment population to Asian population, especially considering all those concepts of precision medicine, precision nutrition. We really have to do more work, more research among Asian population. Yeah, I, I agree. So let me bring uh, Shara in. She's got some questions from the audience to ask you. Thank you, Prof. Brian and uh, Prof. Zhang for that uh, very insightful talk. This topic is certainly a very important topic for many women and uh, certainly to me who's going to be hitting my 30s in a few years. So yeah, we've got a couple of questions from um, the public. Maybe for a start, we'll ask a general question. I think uh, one of our audience is curious. Why does the female reproductive system age at a faster rate than most of the other organ systems within the female body? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a great question, but I, I, um, I, I don't have a good answer. Um, yes, I feel this is um probably can be answered more by uh physiologist like um reproductive biologist. Um, I I don't have I don't know I don't have a good answer. I'm sorry. Maybe Brian or <laughs> or if someone. Yeah, I think that uh. That's an interesting question. It's one we're trying to address too, because it's true that the ovaries seem to age very rapidly. And um, one of the earliest aging organ systems, maybe the thymus as well, and a couple other tissues. But uh, there's definitely long-term impacts of changes in hormone levels uh, as ovaries age, and that's impacting aging in a number of other systems. And um, so the, I think we're trying to address that. And one of the things we're trying to do in animal models is determine if we can slow ovarian aging, uh, what kind of impact does that have on aging in general and life expectancy uh, in female animals? So um, that's a really critical question and I, not enough research has been put into this, these issues, I think. Um, hopefully we can correct that a little bit within the acre, uh, uh, but um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good question. There's a great question. I really hope acre can have addressed that. All right. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think also some of them have uh, commented that, um, I mean, based on a lot of studies, um, intensive lifestyle modifications can show remission of diabetes. Do you think that uh, with intensive lifestyle changes, uh, the PCOS could be curable? I wouldn't think it's, uh, this, is a, this is an interesting question. Um, I think the risk can be decreased. I don't think it can be like can be with a healthy diet and lifestyle. It can eradicate this disease PCOS. Mm -hmm. um, so it can, given the success story of um, healthy diet lifestyle in terms of uh, improve um, glucose metabolism and uh, insulin sensitivity, um, and all, you know this play this possibly play a key role in the etiology of PCOS as well. So it will be helpful. But I don't think it can cure the disease because genetic factors, other factors also play a role as well. I see. Yeah, I really genetic... hope it can cure. <laughs> there have been genetic loci linked to PCOS, I believe. Uh, and and I, I don't know if that's the case for uh, irregular menstrual cycles. Is there a genetic component to that? Yeah, there are, there are genetic um, component and also uh, there have been GWAS on this as well, GWAS, GWAS studies on this as well. But the heritability is not that high, so it's moderate. 
Uh, but genetic factor definitely play a role in terms of for the etiology of uh, this mental cycle status. Um, sure. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think some also are quite curious whether, um, Prof Zhang, do you know if there's any uh, approved therapeutic treatments or um, promising supplements that can potentially support or extend female reproductive function? Hmm. There should be. There, um, I don't know whether there is. There is like a one or two magic supplement. Um, it should. There some some should be helpful, but it's really. There are many supplements like um, in in clinic and also maybe like uh, even buy in the in the in a, in a drugstore like for example in the US. Um, but uh, how helpful they are, it, it is probably are still questionable. Um, and I know Bra has do quite a lot of research on supplement in human and animal, so maybe Bra has some better answer, but. From population health research, I was previously involved in some studies looking at zinc supplementation and folate supplementation in terms of um, uh, for, uh, to improve, to um, uh, reduce, um, to shorten the time to pregnancy. I was not that successful, um, but I think there might be something, something promising. I, I don't know whether there's one or two magic play. Like, <laughs> <laughs> supplement can can be helpful to all the reproductive um, phenotypes. I come mm -hmm. at this from a bit of a strange angle because we we found supplements that affect aging first, and then we got backwards to look at ovarian aging. So this is not a complete answer from the ovarian perspective. There are things I'm missing, but one of the interesting things, and this is most from mostly from animal model data at this point, is several of the supplements and natural products that are thought to impact healthy longevity also seem to preserve ovarian function with age. Uh, and in some cases, um, like a drug like rapamycin, at least in animal models, even allows the animals to stay fertile longer than normal. Uh, but in terms of supplements, things like NAD precursors, alpha ketoglutarate, antioxidants have all been uh, tested and reported in some contexts to uh, alpha ketoglutarate also, I shouldn't forget that. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> uh, they've all been reported to delay ovarian aging, preserve fertility, and affect downstream effects for aging as well. Mm -hmm. So whether that translates to humans, we don't know yet, but it's at least an, an interesting uh, angle to take with the research. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, this kind of highlight again, we really need more, more studies in hu on human especially like large human population-based study. You need more research, um, of course. Yeah, I mean, I was shocked when I got into this field, you know, and looked at it. <laughs> little research, both on the human side and on the animal side. It, it's, uh, it's like a very important part of aging yeah. biology, but it's very neglected as well. So, mm -hmm. um, And it's, it's so important. Thing. Yeah, and so important for women's life, and it can change many things. <laughs> Okay, for the next question, maybe we just uh, quickly changed gear. Um, uh, I think I want to, I'm also quite curious as well, because now you're in a glow NUS, right? And you mentioned that you're looking at some biomarkers. So is there any particular molecular or epigenetic biomarkers that you are looking at or focusing on to identify this high risk group of females? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so we have been working our omics group we are not particularly focused on uh, metabolomics biomarkers. And mm -hmm. uh, so we look at uh, metabolomics, metabolized biomarkers in combination with uh, uh, conventional clinical biomarkers for uh, two purposes. One is for risk prediction. Um, and then the other is for, to, for the dis especially with um, um, the non-targeted metabolomics work, we want to have some discovery to see whether we can identify some normal metabolites or normal pathways in combination with uh, genetics data, like using the multi-omics approach uh, for the etiological research as well. So we are doing this like uh, along this two line. But the other thing is because we are interested in diet, nutrition, lifestyle, you know, studying metabolomics can also give us more insights in terms of precision nutrition as well. So we, we do have quite a lot ongoing work along this line. 
in addition to diet lifestyle, <laughs> those uh, at the population level. So we are, we are also interested in this at the molecular level. So modifiable factors, as I mentioned in my talk, both at um, um, behavior level and also at uh, molecular level. We're particularly interested in potentially modifiable biomarkers as well. Those can be particularly affected by diet and lifestyle. Okay, thank you so much. Um, is it also possible if you could comment if do you, if you think social inequalities have an effect on women's health? Yeah, of course it is. That's um that's also one of uh, um the major risk factors for like for the disease I'm familiar with, like cardiometabolic diseases play a major role. For example, for obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, the social. Mm -hmm. Uh, disparity play a major role as well. Um, All right. Um, I think uh, also one of the uh, questions that uh, was asked is, what are the, some of the major challenges of trying to extend the function of female reproductive system towards increasing health span and lifespan in aging females? Well, this is a more, the there are many challenges <laughs> at different levels. <laughs> So Brian may chime in as well. I'm going to say something from my perspective. Um, so, so I would think I would. Um, there's I'm a, we are doing more from the population health perspective. Um, so, it's um, to do this kind of research. One is to uh, set up a large observational cohort studies to look into that, and the other would be do clinical trials. Um, and uh, to do this, of course, you need uh, need funding, um, and also um, to how to do something really effective. We really need to pin down the research question, and then we need to know quite a lot of background information. But because of the large data gaps, um, so we need a, we still need a, we have a long way to go. Um, I feel. Um, yeah. All right. I think uh, just to add to that, you know, and, and both Glow and Acre are, I think, trying to do this is educating people about some of the challenges with during pregnancy and uh, with fertility and with uh, aging related uh, complications linked to menopause. You know, these are things that people don't think about very often, and many people in the population aren't aware of some of these challenges. So I think a lot can be accomplished just by especially in Asia, just by better uh, uh, providing better education and awareness to the population, even without clinical interventions. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, health right. education is, is important. It's kind of something we can start relatively easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe share one more question. So pick All a good right. one. Okay, I think this one is a situational question. So if let's say you're a woman of 30 years old and you're planning to have children 10 years later, do you think that, um, would you think that um, exploring treatments that can prolong reproductive health, health span or opt for medical egg freezing, which is better? <laughs> do you think the answer will change in about 20, 10 to 20 years later? So I wish I wish Zhongwei is here. <laughs> I think a clinician may be in a better situation of answering this question. And I don't think don't know whether there is a definitive answer for this. No, thanks a lot. This is a, a great discussion. It's something we should talk about more. As we said, it's a neglected area of aging research and uh, sure. <laughs> uh, the connections between fertility, reproduction, and aging that need to be explored in much greater depth. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Trinan, and uh, thanks, Shara. Sure. Um, My pleasure. Want... Thank you again for having me. Thank you. Oh, Good okay. night. Uh, and I want to, you, right? everyone to use the chat function and the panelists and all attendees options to leave comments on the show. Uh, look for news from our center in the School of Medicine and the end credits. Uh, we're also looking for people that want to work on uh, uh, research on aging, including ovarian aging. So uh, let us know. There's a QR code if you're interested. Um, finally, we're calling on applications for our Healthy Longevity Talent Incubator uh, an intensive course where participants and staff will stay 10 days and 10 nights on NUS campus and learn about healthy longevity science. So uh, if you can't get enough of us, you can apply for this and spend 10 days with us. Uh, and then finally, I just want to um, uh, tell everyone to, there's a, obviously a long weekend coming both in Singapore and in the US. So 
uh, enjoy the time off, uh, eat healthy food during this weekend, and uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, the speaker next week will be uh, Professor uh, Pura Munoz Canoves. She's a principal investigator at Altos Labs in San Diego, and she'll be telling us about this exciting new venture in the longevity space. Uh, I'll be uh, there next week for the show as well. I want to leave you with a video of a 67-year-old auntie who can climb better than you. Well, I don't know about you, but better than me for sure. Thanks for joining the show. When I was in my early 50s, and I was having a back problem. She saw me doing stretching and then she said, since you're stretching, why don't you go and stretch on the wall? She taught me the way to climb. Very fierce. Very fierce. Very fierce. <laughs> Anything wrong with it? Not that late! <laughs> Sometimes she said, you're like an elephant on the wall. <laughs> when you reach the top, you find that you have uh, accomplished something. I learned to be more confident. Until now, I don't have bad aches. It also overcomes my height phobia. Right now, any hanging bridge you give me, no problem. My first climb to outdoor was in Taiwan. You don't feel like you're climbing that high up. You find that, oh, the scenery is so nice. I know not many young ones think that the old ones are worth mixing with. They find they are naggy, but uh, her friends are all very sweet. They are always eager there to help you. I may slowly, slowly slow down, but I will not give up. In fact, I, I come with two senior climbers. Both are older than me. It's a matter of you stepping out of your comfort zone only. Yeah, I, I think anyone can climb. I'm 80 and if I can climb, anyone can climb. She doesn't look to crush the hardest route, but also to like support people when they climb. She pushes boundary. I'm proud of my mother. It's the first time I hear from her <laughs> <laughs> that she look up to me. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless Like I'm gonna make it And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down